Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Biofuels in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campani. Join us each week as we explore biofuels in Hawaii and our interviews with some of the various local stakeholders to learn about policy, uh, feedstock, and conversion processes. Today, our guest is Mr. Will Cush, project manager for Terviva here in Hawaii. Terviva is a local biomass feedstock producer. They grow pangamia trees and harvest the seed for its oil. Will earned his Bachelor's of Science uh, degree in chemistry uh, with a minor in natural resources science and management and completed his or has uh, been working on it towards completion his doctoral research at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities in the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering. Will's doctoral research uh, has been focused on assessing the productivity and suitability of novel cellulosic biomass feedstock production uh, for the upper Midwest region of the United States. Will is currently managing the establishment of the first commercial pangamia orchard here in Hawaii, while also searching for and evaluating additional growth opportunities for Terviva. So, welcome to the show, Will. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, Carl. Excellent. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming. This is going to be a vital aspect of this whole series, so I truly appreciate the opportunity to talk. So, let's start with... Tell me about yourself a little bit. Sure. So we just learned a little bit, um, re revise or, or, or reshape what I just said as far as your, what got you here and what you're looking at within this industry. Sure, sure, absolutely. So uh, originally from Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, went over to the University of Minnesota uh, in Minneapolis and uh, uh, earned my degree, earned my undergraduate, and started working towards my graduate, uh, my PhD degree. And uh, I chose the field of biofuels because I wanted to affect uh, the greatest positive change in society as, as, I, could, uh, as I could achieve. And I saw that uh, just given my uh, interest in science and, and uh, just my affinity for chemistry and, and uh, general nerdiness, I thought, what better way to do that than to find a way to make biofuels? And so... Yeah, and so Chem uh, chemistry is one of those things, and you don't even <laughs> you don't even realize how important chemistry is when you're taking it in high school. Yeah, uh, and, and until you start to see what it really can produce and how it can produce things. So yeah, thank so you for doing that, for, yeah. for continuing that pursuit. So, um, so okay, so you wanted to make the largest impact you possibly could, and biofuels seem to be that pathway for you based on your. That's that's what uh, that was my perspective, Carl. Is I okay. thought that. Uh, if I could somehow uh, help uh, in terms of uh, either providing greater access to biofuels for society or helping to uh, find a new conversion pathway or, or in any way, shape, or form help uh, uh, accelerate the adoption of biofuels uh, sure. by our country, I thought that that would be a very productive way to, I, to I help agree. out. And leave I agree. The, Going back to the 70s with ethanol, it's been a thing that's been talked about for a long time. Indeed. And the uh, oil price shocks seems to be the thing that uh, makes the conversation happen more often than not, uh, <laughs> for good and for bad. So, okay. Um, so tell us, you, so you were focusing on cellulosics. Tell us, what's a cellulosic? Yeah, so sure. The, the easiest way to think about cellulosic biomass or biomass in general is just, uh, you can think about it uh, by looking out the window and seeing all the, the trees outside and the grass. Uh, that's any any plant that's growing represents cellulosic biomass. Any plant that's growing, okay. And so, uh, so biomass refers to any can refer to any plant. Cellulosic biomass refers primarily to grasses and trees, okay. Because the structural components of those plants uh, are called cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. Right. Happy to get into the, the nerdier Lign side of lignocellulosic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So okay. Um, so that's what you spent a lot of time working on and trying to figure out the best conversion technologies, the best pathway for conversion technologies in order to achieve fuels. Yeah, so I was looking at, when I was in grad school, I was looking at the productivity of a certain subset of plants, of trees. Uh, how many tons per acre of biomass would they, would they yield if we began to cultivate them in a, in a cellulosic biomass production system? Yeah. And then we also looked at the efficiency with which we can convert that woody biomass, the trees, trees themselves, 
uh, into fuel. And so we looked at uh, making them into ethanol, turning the trees themselves into ethanol. And um, we did that as, a, as just kind of a generic biofuels pathway. There's alternate pathways like pyrolysis or mm -hmm. gasification, but uh, we chose ethanol because there's a... a and that's a different process. That's more of a fermentation process? Exactly. Okay, exactly. So, 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 the, so converting into an ethanol is a fermentation process as opposed to using gasification or pyrolysis where you're converting that more into what? Ah, so if you gasify or, or if you use pyrolysis, what you're doing is you're breaking up, you can think of cellulose, the structural component in wood in this table, mm -hmm. uh, as a long chain of, uh, poly a long polymeric chain of monomers in gasification. There's a lot of technical words. It's okay. <laughs> Stop me if I get too nerdy. <laughs> no, sorry, no, go, go, go. We need it, we need it. Um, so in fermentation, what you do is you use uh, bacteria and enzymes to chop that long polymer chain into monomers, the single building single. block sugars. Poly many, mono meaning one. Yes. Exactly. And uh, you use the bacteria and use enzymes to chop up the chain, and then you feed those uh, monomers, those individual sugar molecules, to bacteria, and the bacteria eat the sugar. And on the other end of the side, on uh, the other end of the reaction, you get ethanol. Uh, Got it. Okay. Same way you make beer. The same way you make beer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. As opposed uh, to the gasification or pyrolysis, which wh then will do what? Which gives you then you get either monomeric or elemental, uh, much smaller mo uh, molecules that you can then rearrange using a catalyst. Or, uh, or using a different strain of bacteria, you can feed that mixture, that witch's brew of, of different uh, stuff that you get when you chop it all up indiscriminately yeah. in, a, in a gasification system. And you can rearrange those molecules into a fuel molecule. And so, uh, end product can be the same. You can make all ethanol right. from gasification or you can make it from fermentation. Um, either way okay. is, uh, uh, after studying it for five years, I figured out that it's uh, fairly technically challenging. Technically, see, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> you were focusing, and your 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 doctorate research has been on cellulosic uh, conversion, and you're currently working with Terviva, which is <laughs> oil-based yes. instead of cellulosic. So, why the tell you were about to go into, but now so tell us why the switch and what happened and. Yeah. Sure, sure. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And, and the, the long and the short of it, Carl, is that converting biomass, converting wood and grass into biofuel is a technology that I believe will be commercially uh, rolled out on a, on a large scale, uh, I hope, sooner than later. Um, we're getting there as a, as a as the scientific community studies it and as uh, researchers are finding new and better ways to adapt this, they're getting there, but it's not quite there yet. The technology is not ready for uh, commercial scale, commercially. Commercial scale. So we have demonstration scale, we have pilot scale for some. We don't have a scale up opportunity yet. We know that we can do it. Technically speaking, we can do though we can make biofuels from cellulosic biomass using these uh, and of the various ASTM classifications and specifications. We can make the jet fuels and the biofuels and the diesels. Yes, from the from all of these processes. Yes, it's the 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 key holdup is that we cannot do it um, in a way such that it is. Uh, uh, economically interesting for a large organization. So the to scale up, um, scale of economy kind of economic not, economic aspect to it. Yeah, so exactly. So we need more money, basically. Much. We need more money to put some research into the technology to get that technology to the next level so we can tweak the efficiencies of it and then be able to then exactly. really produce what's called operational volumes. Exactly. Okay. There you go. Exactly. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. So that's why you shifted from cellulosic to seed oil. And so I shifted because I shifted to seed oils because to uh, to plant oils because I saw that uh, in plant oil to biofuel conversion systems I saw an industry that was already in place and already uh, producing biofuel at scale 
And so I saw, uh, I saw this industry as, as a means where I could achieve that impact that I mentioned earlier, where I could really try to uh, affect change by uh, either producing more biofuel so that we could have the opportunity as a society to choose biofuel over petroleum derived conventional fuel, fossil fuel that we import from abroad. Yes. And so instead of sending our sending dollars to uh, out of the country to, to the tune of five point seven billion dollars in twenty fifteen for the state of Hawaii alone. Exactly. So instead of sending that money off island, we can cycle it back through the local economy yeah. right here by growing oil that we can use to make renewable fuel on island. Which will also create jobs. Which will also create jobs, clean up the environment and help the land. Yeah. And as well as if done, if done along with and alongside food production, we can actually grow our entire ag industry. So we have more local food production, we have biofuel production, biofuel feedstock production, and that helps all of our local farmers. Absolutely. So it gives baseline revenues that aren't currently there. Absolutely. So that's huge, huge important there. So, okay. So when did you first come to Hawaii? So uh, I moved out from Minneapolis to Oakland in 2012 and started uh, traveling out to Hawaii in 2013. Um, we had, uh, Terviva had uh, put in a small pilot planting in uh, Kunia on Oahu in 2012. And so I started coming out in 2013 just to check up on the pilot planting, see how it was doing, see how the trees were growing. And uh, also- well, This was part of your research. Uh, this was this was separate. So this is uh, after I left the PhD program to join Terra Viva full time. Mm, okay. And I okay. So you started off with Terra Viva somewhere in, on the continental U.S. Yes, in Oakland, California. In Oakland, California. Yeah. And then okay. Then eventually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. So more more, more permanently here. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So when when was that roughly that you actually got here more permanently then? In 2014. Okay. And so in 2013, I was checking up on the trees, making sure and they're all happy and growing. And fortunately they were. And at the same time as I was doing that and just seeing how they were growing, I was also uh, helping my colleagues as we were putting together the pieces to set up the conditions so that we could put in a larger actual commercial scale orchard oh. right here on Oahu. So you needed enough land, you needed enough opportunity, you needed to, the one important piece is you needed to know that the trees, because we just glossed over that slightly, you needed to know that the trees would grow here, would grow here in a healthy, productive manner. Exactly. And that's what the first year, a couple of years, how many years? So for the first, uh, first two years, the trees uh, that we put in, uh, in that pilot planting were growing, and they were growing despite the fact that we never fertilized them, we barely gave them any water. Welcome to paradise. That's just how that goes. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, was, it was incredible. And so based on how well and yeah. how well the trees loved growing in paradise. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, based doesn't? on that, uh, we were able to pull together a landowner uh, and a local farmer to help us grow the trees, a local nursery to help us produce more trees. And we were able to assemble all these pieces. And finally, with support from the Energy Accelerator, uh, we were able to start work yes, on... Yes, our good friend Shanna Trevena as well. Yes, uh, yeah, and, uh, and all the good folks in Don Lipperton. And Don Lipperton. And, yeah. yeah, all those, uh, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the accelerator. Excellent, Excellent. good, good, uh, good, good But good, we good. were finally able to start uh, breaking ground in 2014 on our first commercial scale orchard on the north shore of Oahu. That's and spectacular. So That's I've been spectacular. out here since 2014. So two years. Uh, two years now. Two years, and yeah. you love it, right? Absolutely love of it. Of course. Absolutely, Absolutely love it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to take a quick break already. So the first 14 minutes goes really quickly. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. Again, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, the Hawaii Biofuels or Biofuels in Hawaii series. Uh, our guest is Mr. Will Cush from Terviva. So please come back and join us as we continue our conversation. So thank you. See you in a minute. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hoi. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. 
you know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Okay, logo, here's logo. Spectacular. Aloha, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Biofuels in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Today, we're talking with Mr. Will Kutch, project manager of Terviva here in Hawaii. Okay, so now tell me more about Terviva. What is it and how do you operate? Uh, absolutely, be happy to. So, Terviva recognized that there was a, a discrepancy. Uh, uh, Whereas we have increasing demand for agricultural products, food, fiber, biofuel, because we have a growing global population. At the same time that the demand is increasing, the supply is actually contracting because the amount of farmland in production is declining over time. And so in the two areas that we work, uh, I'll, I'll pick on, uh, on Florida and Hawaii as, as case examples, in Florida, an introduced disease is, has wiped out 75%. Introduced disease? Yes, sir. So it's called... It's the two things I have to stop you on, I'm sorry. Please, yeah. <laughs> First of all, well, there's introduced disease, but then, okay, you said that the amount of agricultural land is decreasing. Correct. Why? Can you, is there a simple, like, one yes. so, sentence answer for that? Uh, the short, uh, concise way is that there's desertification, there is disease, there is drought, there is failing economics. All these factors lead to a contraction in the amount of agricultural land that's in productivity. Okay. And so the, as an example, in Florida, a disease was introduced from China called citrus greening, and there is no cure for this disease. And the uh, disease has already wiped out 75% of the state's citrus industry. Wow. And the remaining 25% is... So much uh, for frozen concentrated orange juice. Yeah. Um, so it was accidentally introduced. Correct, correct. But yeah. Uh, Someone went to China, came back, and happened to have it with them. How, how does that happen? How do you even... Be, was it because they brought something with them? Was it like a commercial... Someone brought a commercial quantity of something over that had it on it, and then they planted it or something, or, did, or was it airborne? I mean, I don't know how so, much of it you know, but... Yeah, so uh, nobody knows exactly how the disease arrived. It arrived the same way that invasive species arrive. Yeah. Anywhere you can look, there's yeah, as long as there's a seed in the world. So. And uh, the disease is, is uh, vectored. It's uh, transmitted by an insect called a, a psyllid, and a it's psyllid. A, a flying insect that uh, feeds on trees. And the psyllid carries a bacteria that infects the trees, and that bacteria is uh, the cause of citrus greening. Wow. 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 And okay. so that's Alrighty, where I, I went way off topic here. So sure. Let's get sure, back to that. Yeah. So I just wanted to learn more because you were telling me that. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't delete those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's information there I need to know. Um, okay, so back to Terviva. How long has Terviva been in existence total? And then I think you already told us in Hawaii since about 2013 ish. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Terviva has been around since 2010. Okay. And uh, we started because uh, we saw that disconnect between supply and demand. Right. Um, or rather, other <laughs> demand supply. And uh, we saw an opportunity to utilize a new crop to address that because our existing crops weren't quite meeting the, the needs that we had as a society. And so uh, we decided, after looking at 30 plus different potential new crops, we found Pangamia. As, uh, as an alternative candidate that we could use to drop into existing agricultural areas where productivity or uh, production has declined because of greening in Florida or because of failing economics in Hawaii mm -hmm. that has led to the decline in the sugarcane and pineapple industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've, uh, we saw that Pungamia was a highly productive, very robust and so it's hardy. A high, it's a high yield exactly. plant. Exactly. Or a tree, really. Right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So tell us more about pangamia. They're they're trees, first of all, and they produce seeds. And these seeds produce more trees, but they also produce oil. 
Yes, sir. Tell me about that part, please. Yeah. So, pangamia trees, in addition to being very hardy and, and uh, relatively easy to grow and fast growing, they produce a crop of oil seeds that are relatively similar to soybeans, except that they produce 10 times the amount of oil on a per acre basis that soy does. Wow. And in addition to oil, after you press oil out of the oil seed that you harvest from the tree, there's also a seed cake that's left over. And that seed cake is high in protein. And so we can use that seed cake to produce a cattle feed that we can... Ah, see, and that's, so okay. it, that's can, one of my other questions I've got coming up as well. So yes. excellent. So, okay, so good, good, good. Okay, so it produces an oil and you squeeze the oil out. You have a process that squeezes the oil out of the seed. It's the exact same off-the-shelf equipment. Don't need any new equipment. It's all the existing uh, type of gear that you use to extract uh, sunflower oil, peanut oil, okay. any type of oil from so any type off of off the shelf, seed. which means it's relatively inexpensive. Correct. Okay, so Correct. Lo low capital cost on that side of it. Good, good, good. We need that stuff. So, okay. Um, all right, so we know what that is. How many acres do you have right now? So currently we have 50 acres in the ground. And it's all North Shore? All North Shore. Okay. And we are going to, the contiguous area that we're planting in uh, was sugarcane land 25 years ago. And ever since then, it's been, um, it's been idle. It's been fallow, just growing albizia and Christmas yeah. berry and guinea grass. And so what as we're doing- As much as we like those, <laughs> what are they doing for us? <laughs> So we've been clearing out the albizia, clearing out the guinea, and planting an orchard of our trees. And the whole area that we're planting on uh, that's been abandoned and is idle, not doing anything, is in the neighborhood of 750 acres. Wow. And so while we have 50 so planted you have 50 so acres, far, but you can grow, you've got, you have access to 750 total. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. And so what's your, what's your current like yield? What are you currently producing out of those 50 acres? Yeah, so those those acres, uh, we only planted them last year, and so uh, they're not yielding anything yet because okay. it takes it takes uh, roughly three to four years until you get a uh, commercially harvestable amount of oil seeds from the tree. Okay. Um, so they'll start to produce some seeds next year, um, but okay. not enough to make it worthwhile to go in and. And do you have contracts currently, uh, I mean, to, to whom do you sell both of these products? You've got oil, yeah. you've got oil which can be converted into, do you also do the conversion into the fuel or do you, do you just create the oil and you sell the oil itself? Uh, it, it, the latter, yes. Yeah. So we, we envision ourselves right now to be a feedstock company. And so we're okay. producing a raw vegetable oil that we can then supply to folks locally who have already established the systems and the facilities and infrastructure that's utilized and up and running uh, that converts. And that company happens to be Pacific Biodiesel. Yes, <laughs> they're amazing. Bob and yes, Kelly, they're, they're great. And they're, they're pioneers right there. Their facility on, on the Big Island is, is beautiful. They have um, an excellent facility using some of the best technology anywhere in the country. And so we can send our oil to the Big Island and, and make renewable fuel right away. And then you have your seed cake that is a fertilizer, you were saying. So you have a secondary ancillary product that you can sell. So you have a, multiple markets to help stabilize it and diversify it. Exactly. So we, we uh, hedge our bets a little bit. So if oil, petroleum oil drops to 10 bucks a barrel or something yeah. ridiculous, um, we still have another product from, from our orchard, which is the seed cake. And so that, uh, that buffers our, our business a little bit. It gives us a little bit, of, uh, a little bit of room. And we can utilize the seed cake as a fertilizer. Um, it is actually commercially available as a fertilizer. You can go out and buy it. Um, although I think more interesting out here will be to make a cattle feed out of it ah. so that we can support our local cattle ranchers. I like that. I like that because the idea of fertilizer starts to bring into question of other, other environmental impacts that you may have. Yeah, and so uh, the way that I envision it, Carl, is that I think that we'll be making renewable fuel from our, from our oil, and I think that we'll be making cattle feed from our seed cake so that we can 
uh, support our cattle ranchers and help them make truly local Hawaiian beef Excellent. rather than... Excellent. I love, I love that. I love all of that. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so let, let's jump to this. Um, real quickly, what would you say is the role of oils, seed oils, algal oils, oils yeah. in the biofuels industry? What is the role of it? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it a short-term role, role? Is it a long-term? Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, it's an excellent question, Carl. And I, personally speaking, I envision uh, plant oils as being a, uh, in the transportation sector, a baseload type energy, if you can think of it, and also in the electrical generation sector. So we can burn biodiesel in the HECO utilities uh, assets and make baseload renewable power, 100% uh, renewable electricity to complement the intermittent solar and wind power that is fed into the grid. Uh, alternately, we could use the biodiesel that we make as a uh, as a renewable, locally produced, environmentally friendly transportation fuel for those heavy diesel. So that's what we have here. This picture here is uh, talking about jet fuel and diesel. Yeah. So uh, so we we have uh, we have made and established the fact that we can make biodiesel out of our Pangami oil. Works great. Uh, the technology is existing. Uh, we've also looked at uh, whether or not we can make uh, other additional fuel products out of the Pangami oil as well. And we've actually confirmed that we can make jet fuel from Pangami oil that passes jet A specifications. See, that's, that's spectacular. So, okay. Uh, we only have, again, like about a minute left here. We also know that, um, so that's, so again, is that sh more short term? Is that mid term? Is it longer? Is it, is it always going to be there? Or will cellulosics at some point overcome that because it's a larger yield factor? Wh where is that? Uh, excellent question. And when I look into the future 10 years, 20 years down the line, I absolutely see both. I don't think it's either or at all. I think that it's definitely going to be complementary systems where you're going to have uh, industries and, and facilities set up to handle both feedstocks because, uh, frankly, we, we need both. Um, we produce and consume a tremendous amount of energy and fuel in this country. And, and I dare I dare say that uh, so we we're, will we're continue gonna, we're gonna to have do both. so. We're going to have both. Okay. Yes. The last, like, 10 seconds, you just received an award. You see this picture here. Uh, Terviva just received an award with the governor. Um, in 10 seconds, tell us about that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was an absolute delightful surprise, and I feel tremendously honored to be recognized by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Yeah. And um, and so I'm, I'm just very grateful to have been in, included in such a group of uh, honored guests at, at that forum. Yeah. And no, so, spectacular it was, we need a lot more of that so thank you so much for joining me today sorry we don't have more time yes. uh, but you're welcome <laughs> to come back we can dig into any of these that you want to and i'd be happy to so uh, so okay thank you so much for joining us this is think tech hawaii's movers shakers and reformers the biofuel series biofuels in hawaii series uh, thank you for joining us thank you to the crew thank you to the staff thank you to everyone involved here uh, thank you to our guest mr will Cush, and to terra viva for everything they're doing see you next week take care